My old friend, uh, Taylor Branch, my, my friend of long standing, uh, t- Taylor Branch. Uh, the, the, the world knows Taylor, of course, through his monumental three volume series of America and the King Years, Parting the Waters, Pillar of Fire, and At Canaan's Edge. Also, many of you may know him from his novels, Empire Blues, right? <laughs> so we've been friends of long standing. And, and your book with, uh, with John Dean and Bill Russell, right? And, uh, and we at the Atlanta, the Clinton Tapes book, of course, we at the Atlantic uh, know Taylor for his wonderful piece in 2011 about the shame of college sports, or sort of exposing what was going on in the NCAA. Taylor is particularly known to me as my direct predecessor at the Washington Monthly Magazine. In 1972, when I was just out of graduate school, Taylor was just going off on a political venture where he and a young man from Arkansas were organizing uh, Texas for the McGovern campaign. It didn't work out so well for McGovern, but each of you and uh, Bill Clinton went on to uh, two interesting ventures since then. Taylor, um, the only thing I have blamed Taylor for since then is that the day after I was hired as Taylor's successor at the Washington Monthly, the magazine declared Chapter 11 bankruptcy. <laughs> you knew that was coming. You <laughs> kept that to yourself, but, it, but it, it's, it's still, <laughs> it's, it still, uh, still goes on. So Taylor has a new book, uh, The King Years, which is a distillation of what he's written about Martin Luther King and America over these last decades in ways that makes it more accessible for students, for for other people, and we're going to talk about that and then some of the larger issues of race, politics, and, and all the rest. So we're going to talk together for a while, then we'll have questions from, from the audience. So Taylor, first, just tell us about this book. How does this, how is it different from, how is it the same, similar to, and how does it build on what you've been doing for these past decades on the King Saga? Well, it, it, it's mostly a distillation uh, caused by two factors um, other than the nagging of my publisher. Um, <laughs> And they are uh, long-standing communications with teachers who said they welcomed the storytelling style in the big books, but that they were hard to assign 800-page books uh, for college students, let alone high school. And um, when I finished the trilogy, I went all the way to Idaho for the Gilder Lerman Institute on Teaching American History and found that hi- teachers in Mormon, all-white Idaho were eager to teach the civil rights movement, but desperate for material and very beleaguered, saying our school tests only on English and math, not on history, and we're under pressure, we don't get good textbooks, and usually on Sunday night I'm fixing dinner for my kids and trying to Google for something that I can give my kids that would engage them. If you could break down what you did into things that are more accessible in the digital age, it would be a service. So that was one thing uh, over the years, trying to make it more accessible. uh, the second one, which we'll talk about later, is an increasing frustration that, to me, our political discourse is so out of phase and our political memory out of phase with what it ought to be um, that a more concentrated view uh, uh, that could put together the essential stories over the full sweep of the civil rights movement in a concentrated way might make it more clear how out of phase we are. Yeah. So part of the experiment is technical for the digital age and for students and for modern readers who may not be be picking up books. And I have had numerous complaints of people uh, about their collarbones (laughs) and everything on flights and this sort of thing. So part of it is technical and into this new age of digital uh, uh, teaching and courses uh, and, and that sort of thing to have a more concentrated version. And part of it is substantive. And so in the enhanced version of this, there are recordings of speeches and phone calls and all the rest that people Yes, get. see, yeah. some of this yeah. is so newfangled. I, had, I can't even <laughs> read my own enhanced e-book. <laughs> I, I saw my son has an iPad, and it has it on there. iPad can do it. Kindle cannot. Nook can or something. And, <laughs> and in the text of the e-book, if you're reading along and it describes a demonstration, occasionally there'll be a little uh, box that'll say, if you click here, you can see news footage of this demonstration. Or if I'm yeah. describing Dr. King talking to Lyndon Johnson, there'll be a little box that says click here and you can hear them mm. literally talking to one another over the White House f- phone conversation. Uh, so it's, it's pretty neat, but it's all frontier for me. So through your King saga and other books uh, you have done, you've produced a lot of history, uh, invaluable history that, that readers and critics have, have loved. You've also more and more talked about history and the way we use history in our, our current uh, political discussions and, and conscious and unconscious life. 
We're talking actually, uh, you know, just very recently about the extraordinary series of anniversaries or milestones that are coming up now, the 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. And of course, we have just a couple of days ago, we have the first re-elected non-white president being sworn in on the Lincoln Bible, Bible and the Martin Luther King Bible. And you're saying that in a way, the 50th anniversary string we're about to go through, you wish America would pay more attention to. Tell us about why that is so and how you think we should properly understand the string of 1963 episodes that are coming for us. Well, this month, this January, begins a string of extremely resonant anniversaries about the Civil War era and the Civil Rights era, a century apart and now 50 years, that I hope if we take advantage of them and we're brave enough to, to to get outside our comfort zones and, and think about our unconscious assumptions and how they might be wrong, that we can get more into balance and it can re re repair, in many respects, our discourse. The way I think about it most, um, uh, one way of thinking about it, just to get in the door, is that this is the 50th anniversary not only of the month that Dr. King decided to go into Birmingham because he, was, he gave up on any hope that President Kennedy would issue uh, an executive order to end segregation, uh, which he had thought might be easier for Kennedy, but he knew it would be easier for him because the students had been pressuring him to join the Freedom Rides and risk himself more, and he didn't want to do it. But finally, after it took 23,000 soldiers to get James uh, Meredith into Ole Miss, he literally said, we're losing our window in history. I've got to take greater risks. And he didn't tell his own father because he knew his father was, uh, would uh, talk him out of it and hated that sort of risk. Um, but he began in January 1963 to prepare for the demonstrations in Birmingham starting in April that fizzled in spite of his letter from Birmingham jail but when he sent small children in front of dogs in fire hoses starting on May 2nd, it was the tipping point psychologically for America and the whole world. So we're, and that's another anniversary that will be coming up, the letter from Birmingham jail in April and the, the children's marches in May and Medgar Evers in June and uh, the, the death of Medgar Evers. So we're marching through that. The way I like to think about it, just to, to open the door as to how out of phase we are, <coughs> is that 50 years ago this month was also when George Wallace, took office in Alabama in a famous inaugural speech pledging segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever in a South that had segregation embedded in the constitutions of the southern states and in the institutions widespread across the North in a society that was so segregated that it's beyond the memory we take for granted all of these things that were, were easy. College sports in the South were segregated. There were no professional sports teams in the segregated. There was no Southern, there was no Sun Belt. It was poor. Segregated by race down to the public libraries. Segregated by gender to the point that there were no female students at the University of Virginia. Very few at my old alma mater in North Carolina. None at Yale and Princeton yet let alone West Point, let alone in combat in the military. The word gay hadn't even been invented. No, nothing for disability, no seat belts in cars, TV ads incessantly promoting cigarettes as healthy, sophisticated, and invigorating. That's 50 years ago. Wallace pledged to protect segregation only 50 years ago. He failed, but in his failure, he invented most of the language that is chillingly contemporary today in resenting the government and the political activity that forced about these changes for equal citizenship through the doorway of race and then opening up to everybody else. He started cussing when it was no longer respectable to stand up and defend segregation. He started cussing the government and the politics that, that, that people resented and feared for these changes ahead. He talked about pointy-headed bureaucrats in Washington telling you how to run your business and where you had to send your school, children to school, and that they were in cahoots with a biased national media that had a racial agenda uh, whose effective goal was to concentrate all, central power, all power in the central government in Washington. That language is contemporary. It's the language of government is bad. It flies in the face of what I hope a historical re-reckoning. A lot of us, it started out consciously in resistance, although 
Wallace's first, second step after, in, after inventing all of these ingenious terms that we live with, his second one was to insist indignantly, whenever questioned, that he had never said anything in his whole public career that had any bad racial reflection on anyone, and that there was no racial motive in any of this, because that is a sine qua non of, of creating unconscious memory in culture. And it became comfortable for a lot of people because most people are in the business of making themselves comfortable. Barack Obama is not. Any, any minority person lives having to stretch themselves across the boundaries because their accepted world is not the accepted world. So Barack Obama is the first elected African American president, but he's also the one who's mentioned race least since Dwight Eisenhower. And whenever he does, a storm comes up. If he says his, his son would have looked like Trayvon Martin, the whole world goes nuts, saying that he's being too black or he's doing. So it shows that we are accepting and we're moving forward, and it is vital, but we're doing it on our terms. Uh, that is, the majority culture is doing it on our terms, and we're, we're blind to the fact that our unconscious assumptions have our political discourse, anti-government, in which big government is, 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 is bad, is out of phase with what ought to be a very bracing and optimistic view of what we've accomplished in the last 50 years that ought to steal us for the task of again stepping outside our comfort zones and again trying to tackle difficult problems today. And just to follow on what you were saying, if you were magically in charge of how these 50th anniversary celebrations are going to go for the next uh, year. If Barack Obama had been your lifelong friend, as Bill Clinton was when, when he was in office, how would you have us understand the successes and the failures of, uh, of these, these past stuff? Just, just to elaborate more on, on what you're just saying, what do you, would you like the majority culture to uncomfortably focus on more? As we go through the steps, go through these anniversaries, be open to discovery of things that are either taken for granted, that are blessings from, from this, or that are, have been wiped out of consciousness the, the way we wiped out of consciousness after the, after all, this is not a new thing. When I, we did the same thing for the Civil War. We totally reinvented a history in, in which, it, you know, the re, a mytho mythological history of Gone with the Wind, uh, and we wiped out uh, um, what we actually did through terror to restore white supremacy in the South. And um, to some degree, we're doing that again here. But if we went through each anniversary, Dr. King deciding to go to Birmingham this month, the letter from Birmingham jail, study the letter from Birmingham jail in, uh, what, only three months' time now, these children's demonstrations. In Baltimore, we have um, Freeman Hrabowski, uh, the president of the University of Baltimore, uh, Maryland, Baltimore County, went to jail as a 12-year-old for Dr. King, and he was not the, young, the, the youngest. There were eight-year-olds, and most of them were girls. Um, he's the only one that I know who went to jail with his parents' permission, because generally speaking, the parents thought it was insane that Dr. King would permit small children to go to jail, into Bull Connor's jails uh, for nothing. Um, but. Freeman went, and of course it's a defining moment in his life. I think if, 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 if lots of Americans could hear Freeman Hrabowski, this amazing, hard-charging yeah. president of a, of, a, of a wonderful university, talk about how those decisions shaped his life, how scared he was. He, he calls himself a fat nerd who only wanted to study math, uh, but he couldn't, he couldn't get away from this. And he will tell the story of how the white the white school board required his principal to, to expel him and everybody else in his school that participated in this demonstration, even after he got out of jail, you know, seared but inspired. Um, and how the white city uh, school officials came to the school to make sure that the black principal expelled the demonstrators. And it, Freeman, if you could hear him give the speech in which he quotes what the principal said that simultaneously satisfied the people who were there to make sure that you, that you were getting expelled and also com communicated to every kid in the room 
that he was secretly proud of him, but he was surviving his job. You knew what you were doing when you went in that demonstration. You knew what you would be risking. You knew that this day would be coming. Uh, but you did it anyway. A and very skillfully, this, this um, pastor told us. So we have all these anniversaries uh, coming up that I think should be both bracingly realistic about things that a lot of people didn't want to know, but ultimately inspiring about what good things can happen beyond race when you go through the doorway of our, uh, of our racial comfort zone, when you step outside of it, which is what I think everybody ought to do on Martin Luther King Day. One last quick thing. As you go through these milestones, they're not all overtly racial. By the time you get to 1965 and Selma, you'll get to the Immigration Reform Act of 1965, yeah. which I call the third great pillar of the civil rights mm -hmm. era, um, in which President Johnson, uh, again, if we're talking about race and memory, um, I call him the most influential non-person in American history, <laughs> because we only talk we only talk about Lyndon Johnson every decade for about two weeks when one of Robert Caro's books comes out. <laughs> <But> otherwise, <laughs> otherwise we don't, because you can't really talk with him about talk about him without going through the doorways uh, of race. And one of them that we close off by our, by our stunted uh, memory is the Immigration Act of 65, which repealed essentially a race-based right. limits on legal immigrants and who could become naturalized citizens. And he went up to the, he went up to the uh, Statue of Liberty, signed this bill, repealing the National Origins Act that grew out of eugenics and essentially Yankee scientific um, um, Ivy League racism of hierarchy of races, eugenics. Uh, that's what it grew out of. Uh, and, it, and it restricted legal immigration. 80% of the slots were reserved to England, Germany, and Ireland. Didn't even want Southern Europe, let alone uh, many other countries. He repealed it, said never again will the twin barriers of prejudice and privilege shadow the gate to freedom. It's first come, first serve. It has symbolically and literally changed the face of America, but so slowly that most people don't appreciate it, that we not only are a pioneer democracy in conception, struggling to make it real, but we have people from all over the world and communities from all over the world that didn't exist before 1965. So there are many of these milestones that are going to come up in the next five years. 63 to 68, 2013 to 2018, and every single one of them, if we do our job, that's one reason I'm hoping this is out, could not only restore accurate memory, but through restoring accurate memory, shift our, our national dialogue and discourse in a healthy direction. On the Immigration Act, from my different set of preoccupations, I agree with you that as a crucial moment in American history, I've often written that that act was the step which guaranteed America's preeminence in the world. It, it allows us to, to have a disproportionate share of the world's talent and that, that it's always been a disruptive process to absorb uh, foreign cultures, but the U.S. has, has been able to, to do it. So let me now ask you, your books are rich because they're about politics and culture and religion and language and personal character. I'm going to ask you about a, a current political version. You've talked about the, in a way, the success of the George Wallace movement in changing the language of politics and having this unconscious rhetoric of being anti-government coming from being anti-Eisenhower uh, troops and, 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 and thereafter. There's another way in which you could say that movement is nearing its end because the conversion of the Republican Party to a white person's party, uh, that seems to be behind their, uh, their fears about they're, go they're going to be on the wrong side of actuarial trends if they alienate Latinos and blacks and, and everybody else. How do you see the trends you've talked about? How, how do you see party politics reflecting this changed um, demographic nature of America? Are, there, are the Republican Party, is it going to ride down the, you, you describe it going up, becoming a white person's party. What is going to happen to it now? Uh, that's a really good question question, and it is part of my hope that we may be poised. You know, 50 years is a blink of history, but it is a, an amount of time to absorb things. And to me, the, cor the only correct um, uh, view in the long run, uh, a way of looking and trying to slow down these changes, is that they've been so rapid 
that you could understand a conservative party saying, let's digest these and slow down a little bit. But what we've had instead is, as part of that, going uh, essentially in a cul-de-sac on a dead-end road saying that anything government does is bad as an attitude. It's an attitude about government. Sometimes it manifests itself in overspending. Sometimes it, it's just contempt for people in politics. Some uh, Cynicism. Um, it, it's no accident that the watchword of politics today is spin, meaning that politics isn't really going anywhere. It's just for entertainment and soap opera, whereas the watchword in, in the civil rights era was movement. You know, thing, people are individually moved and the whole country is, is being moved. So the, the, the adjustment against politics that I put into yeah. one chapter here, trying to, yeah. I took the Democratic Convention in uh, mm -hmm. Atlantic City, 1964, yeah. and put it together with a chapter that was uh, a bunch uh, separated in the larger trilogy of the Republican Convention that happened at the Cow Palace in 1964 when they expelled all the old black and tan <laughs> black folks uh, and Goldwater uh, had just announced that he was going to vote against the Civil mm -hmm. Rights Act of 1964 as a usurpation of states' rights. He did that after consultation with his two lawyers, Robert Bork and William Rehnquist, mm -hmm. who wrote long discursive things that I guarantee you had nothing about race in them. They were all about theories of government and state sovereignty and so forth. But as soon as Goldwater announced that he was going to vote against that bill, the first Southern Republicans in a century sprang up out of the soil uh, and, and endorsed it. And, and, of course, the same thing happened to Lyndon Johnson, who, to me, I think there's news in this. He literally almost had a breakdown in the White House during this convention because he, he, um, he's trying to steer a path from a solid South segregation Democratic base to a multiracial party with a tiny little recognition for an integrated group with Fannie Lou Hamer uh, from the Mississippi Freedom Democrats to give them symbolic votes. And one of the things that you can hear in the enhancements is Carl Sanders, my governor, because I'm from Atlanta, the, the, the moderate and good guy, he, he, he was in our church. And Cufflinks Carl, he was, <laughs> uh, he, he was considered uh, too fashionable because he would entertain the notion of, of integration. But he called Lyndon Johnson and said, if you allow even those two symbolic votes there, the whole South will walk out. You are cutting our throats from ear to ear because you're turning the Democratic Party over to Martin Luther King and letting him decide who can be a Democrat. And you can hear Johnson's response here, and I, I try to describe it. But it shows how in one year, 1964, race unconsciously inverted the whole partisan structure of politics in the United States without anybody really talking about it. We still live with it. It's still going on. But I agree with you, Jim. That idea that, that government is bad, that is mostly an attitude and not a judgment, like cynicism. That's what cynicism is an attitude, not a judgment that things don't look good. It's an attitude that I don't want to go down that road. I, I want to be to find that as a dead end road. It's kind of nearing the end of its useful life because essentially it denies any constructive program for the government. Um, that's why their anti tax that's how they steer the notion of being anti tax and anti deficit at the same time. Um, uh, and there are many signals, and th my dad's a dry cleaner. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, uh, a southern dry cleaner's son. I care a lot about fiscal responsibility and everything, <laughs> and, and you can care about the deficit, but it's a sure sign that the real thing that is the underlying attitude toward government if you don't celebrate the few times when we don't have deficits uh, because you're in a hurry to cut taxes and get the deficits right back. We didn't hear anything about the few times. We have only had two times when we had surpluses in the last 55 years since the Cold War. One, when President Johnson decided to balance the budget at the heat of the Vietnam War just to show he could do it. And the, and the other, when Bill Clinton did it for a year and a half. And none of the people who care about the deficit really, really cared about that, studied it, said, let's be careful and hang on to this moment. No. They, and the fact that they didn't, to me, is a signal about this unconscious politics, that what was really important to them was the attitude against government and mining votes from it. And I think you're right, Jim, that that is nearing 
the end of a road and they're going to have to figure out what to do with it and the country needs nothing more than creative Republicans who will help them turn that corner. I was on Face the Nation with Condoleezza Rice the other day and I, I urged her to run for office <laughs> saying, you know, that if people yeah. like her run, ran for office they could help uh, shape a new dialogue within her party. Just to underscore Taylor's point about how, how, the, how Bill Clinton was not giving credit for the deficits, you can look this up. In the spring of 2001, a main subject of discourse at sessions like this and editorial pages was the danger to world financial markets of chronic surpluses in the U.S. budget. <laughs> that there would not be able, there wouldn't be markets and treasury notes and all the rest, and uh, that gave us the, the tax cuts and, and so on. You mentioned many of the things that are just shockingly different in the fabric of America in, in 50 years span. Something that comes through to me from your works is the something that's missing, which was the very powerful voice from Martin Luther King about nonviolence as a philosophy, as a strategy, as a tactic. I hope I have this quote right. He's saying, unmerited suffering is redemptive. I believe that was after the, the Birmingham uh, bombings. Is there any such voice? Why do we not hear a voice like that in America now? Well, that's, that's a, a really important question, too, and I hope as we march through these anniversaries that will, that will be part of the recovery and the healing of, of memory. Nonviolence, I think you can, I make the argument that it was the most powerful social uh, force driving the movement in its creative phase, but it was also the first essential movement idea to become passé, and it came, became passé on the left. There's no place that it was more viciously attacked than from the left. And sometimes with good reason. Uh, from, why does America admire nonviolence only in black folks? Otherwise, we admire James Bond and John Wayne and, you know, Mel Gibson is getting dirtier and dirtier through every movie that solves our social problems by killing off the bad guys at the end. Um, so we turned against nonviolence. Uh, I argue to the point that it's not even discussed in most universities, uh, by and large, either as a, as, a, as, a, as a tool for social justice or even more objectively as, as a matter of theory. What's the relationship between violence and power? Um, Hannah Arendt, my teacher at Princeton, said that we had always been, uh, uh, it was customary to teach that violence and, and power were synonymous even define government as a monopoly of legitimate violence, okay? She said that in the modern world she thought violence and power were opposites. And she would say, think about it, if everybody was fighting and we were all killing one another, uh, right and left, nobody would have any power. P power is cooperation, particularly in a, in a, in a divided world, uh, to accomplish social goods, that's, that's what it is. And in my discussions, uh, I find that really the only people who are discussing violence with the kind of clear-minded, out of my comfort zone that I think you need to have for racial history and to be accurate are people in the military uh, at the National War College. Uh, I've been to the National War College a couple of times and they have, um, you know, lives depend on it. They don't want to overemphasize what the military can do. And by and large, there are historians over there who say ever since Napoleon invented industrialized war, the tendency of history is that violence destroys more but governs less. And we need to have a far more real, uh, realization of that by politicians managing what's political and what's inherently mili uh, military. Everybody reaches to violence as the easy solution, uh, just as they reach to their own racial assumptions uncomfortable about the best uh, way out. So uh, nonviolence was rejected partly from the left. So was spiritual values, by the way, which was another part of the great essential move. move. The, the most distinctive thing about Dr. King was, to me, he had many enemies. Don't ever let anybody convince you that this nation was up close and personal with Martin Luther King. Yeah. He was getting banned from yeah campuses right up to the end of his life. So he was controversial. He had plenty of enemies, far beyond J. Edgar Hoover slandering him. Um, but he was never attacked for mixing church and state. No record of his worst enemy attacking him for mixing church and state. And he talked about religion and politics every day, two or three speeches. Why? To me, a lot of his genius in communication was that he 
he put one foot in the scriptures and one foot in the Constitution um, in a very, very balanced way and, sit, and didn't try to subvert one with the other or kick one out, which is really what most of that discourse is about. And he'd basically say, take your pick. If you care about equal souls uh, and, and religion, uh, uh, talk about race relations in the terms of equal souls. If you care about equal votes and America's civic tradition, talk about it that way. I don't care. And he, if you go back and study his, his oratory, almost always he's putting forward paired phrases of secular and spiritual uh, inspiration that are joined you know, at, at their depths. And we've gotten away from that. You know, nowadays, people from Dr. King's tradition, by and large, concede the field of religion to what is known as the religious right which had the audacity you know, in, in the early 70s to stand up and say, we're the moral majority, which is a political statement and, uh, and a spiritual statement. And, and uh, Dr. King's side abandoned the field. So there are lots of ways in which we are complicit, in my view, in the cynicism uh, that's dominated our politics. One possible exception to what you just said about the left uh, seeding the religious field is I'm struck that there have been recent speeches that are one foot in scripture and one foot in the Constitution. For example, President Obama's second inaugural address, where he seemed to, to argue his progressive agenda by saying it comes from scripture and from the Constitution, from the founders. As someone steeped in the works and thought of Dr. King, tell us how you view President Obama's rhetorical presentation and anything else about him. Well, that last, uh, your point, to me, it was enormously bracing that he did that because when you frame it in terms of the larger values, it's more important than framing something yeah. purely in race. In fact, I think that framing it in terms of gay rights was really smart yeah. because if you talk about the larger values and essentially try to draw an agenda that way, you're helping the opposition to, to meet that corner where total anti-government is a dead end and they've got to answer it somehow. So I think that the, I think that the speech was great. My, I don't have, I met President Obama m mostly when he was a senator because the Senate Democrats would invite historians up to have lunch with him uh, from time to time. Uh, the only time I've really spent any time with him as president was once he invited me in to talk about the March on Washington mm. uh, t with him and Michelle and he said, we were, we, were not, we were just two years old, um, <laughs> so we don't know very much about it, but it's <laughs> certainly affected my life a lot, and I, um, I would like uh, to talk for you to talk about the March on Washington, and what do you see as uh, significant about it? And uh, I do have March on Washington yeah. as one of the 18 moments. When I, there is blood on the floor here, because uh, <laughs> I had to take less than 10 percent of the, of the material um, stitch it together, sometimes with words from more than one book, and then write an introduction to each one that would summarize everything left out and try to drop you into context in a story. And one of them is the March on Washington. Uh, it, 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 it survived, but in many respects, I'm more interested in trying to take readers here um, a little bit through the speeches, but through America's unconscious expectations of the March on Washington, as compared with the, mytholo the, the, the mythologizing of it since. We were terrified of the March on Washington before it happened. We were stockpiling plasma. We outlawed, we banned liquor sales for the first time since Prohibition, the week before. Mm. And to me, the most amazing minor detail is that Major League Baseball, uh, five days before the march, canceled the Washington Senators game, not only on the day of the march, their scheduled game here, but the day after the march. They canceled two games in advance because, you know, who knows how much detritus and wreckage and, 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 and hemorrhage there would be when you have all these marauding hordes here. So one reason that we idealized the march so much is because uh, um, we were embarrassed that we had things so wrong that the uh, cultural assumption was you, you could not bring a large integrated group into the capital of the United States uh, without it being, without the Visigoths, uh, you know, federal employees giving the day off. Um, so there are a lot of neat things about the March on Washington, but I did want to include it. I had to skip a lot of things, um, but I didn't skip that. I have two other questions before I turn this over to, to our crowd here. 
Um, one is I often find my limited immersion in American history somewhat consoling about our current situation because things have been bad through a lot of American history. We had a civil war. We had all kinds of, of, of uh, fracas and, and, and friction. There are many people who argue that American culture now is more frayed than in a long time. Public schools are on the decline. The military is its own little uh, cadre of, of people. There's cynicism about government. From how does your knowledge of history make you feel temperamentally about the state of American culture now? Does it make you downcast or thinking we've been through this before? Well, I'm downcast about the state of our political discourse, mm -hmm. um, subject only to what you first raised, because I'm at the same place that I think we may be at a turning point in getting things uh, more accurate and bring them into balance. But it won't happen automatically. It takes people trying to assert this and reclaim it. Um, and there are, there are, I'll mention this, which, which may be dangerous. There's some resistance to claiming the larger benefits of the civil rights initiatives on racial grounds, mm -hmm. because some of the people who were, it was a time when African Americans were leaders for all of America, not just for doing stuff for themselves, but for all of America. That's why President Johnson's uh, speech when he said, we shall overcome, to me, was more visionary from its very first sentences when he said that the marchers in Selma that were beaten on bodies, and they were, they were all black, that they were a moment like Concord and Appomattox, so it was at Concord, so it was at Appomattox, that destiny and our values collide. He was putting that, that march not only in the heart of American patriotism, but in the vanguard. He was saying they were our leaders. And um, that's, uh, that's something that's pretty foreign from us. Although, again, that was very striking in President Obama's recent speech, having the same uh, sequence of Seneca Falls, Selma, and Stonewall. Yes. Again, from, from good things happen. Yeah. Good things happen when you do that. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I hope they'll happen again. So last question off topic, but something you are one of our national experts on too, sports. Uh, you had this, this really devastating indictment of the corruption of the NCAA a year and a half ago or so in the, in the Atlantic. There's now an argument that professional football is sort of on the long track down just because of, of sort of like boxing. It's going to be seen as too damaging of, of people. What's, what's your current view of college sports and also the NFL? Do you think these are on the, the long slide of history? <laughs> Well, you, you write a 20,000 word article, you get asked this no, question. No, you're absolutely <laughs> right. I asked for it. Um, <laughs> but uh, take anything I say with a grain of salt because you'll see I'm wearing a lot of purple um, I'm from Baltimore. <laughs> and uh, we have a very big game coming up. And I, I hope people don't get concussions, but uh, I'll be watching whether they do or not. Um, so it's different. Um, professional sports are phenomenally popular. I, I'm hoping that good things will happen in the, um, uh, in, on the safety side. Um, uh, I will say this. Um, I predict that you will see studies in the next five years that say most of the damage that's inflicted, particularly on football players, is not on professional. It's at high school level. That's where the most of the hitting is. Uh, and college level. They have more than the pro people. So uh, we're kidding ourselves if we, th if we think that only those high level collisions out in pro sports, which are significant, but I mean, it, it, these, are, these are professionals. And, um, um, and at least they are governed by competitive rules and competitive laws and uh, in which everybody has an agency now that there are unions and bargaining and their laws and I, I hope we can deal with it. College sports is something wholly different. To me, in, in many respects, it's like racial history in the sense that people have millions of reasons that they want college athletes to be amateurs, that they want them to be amateurs. But ever since that article came out, I have been hounding people, and I can't get a single soul to even address the question of by what right and by what authority. We deny college athletes alone, not any other student, if you've told any other student you can't be paid as a teaching assistant, you can't have a work-study job, you're an amateur, you're just a, a scholar, you can't be compensated for your skill, your effort, your labor. Um, no, no state legislature could write such a law. But only for the 
athletes do we say, we convince ourselves, well, they're privileged anyway, they should shut up and study, they blah, blah, blah. There are millions of rationalizations as to why the field should be the way it is now, and not one single person will, so far, in, in my view, has said, if I were writing a law to justify the athletes only amateurization that deprives them of due process, right of compensation, right of representation, whatever, essentially while they're pursuing two careers at once, which is not new in America. Plenty of people pursue two careers, student and athlete. Uh, nobody will do it. And it's going to fall of its own weight. Uh, um, I, I do predict that it's going to fall. There are lawsuits all over the place. My home state of Maryland just filed a lawsuit against the Atlantic Coast Conference for uh, trying to enforce a penalty uh, for leaving the Atlantic Coast Conference and jumping to the Big Ten. And what was their argument? That, that the penalty clause was a restraint of trade. <laughs> restraint of trade on Maryland's ability to maximize its earning power. If you are in a capacity where you're taking sports that depends on the labor of athletes, I mean, after all, who's the camera pointed at? Uh, it's not pointed at, at the coach. And the cheerleader sometimes. Pointed at sometimes. the athlete. <laughs> if, you're, if you are aggressively commercializing uh, an enterprise like that to the point that you think any interference of your ability to maximize revenue is, should be illegal, and don't think that that argument might apply to the people who are actually producing the revenue, that shows how unconscious we are of what we're doing to, to have the to steal all the revenue from the athletes that are producing and then have the nerve to say, we're doing it for your own good so that you can enjoy the blessings of amateurism. Um, and uh, so your assignment at the Atlantic, I went in there only, uh, I was an innocent child. I said, <laughs> <laughs> I've always wondered why the NCAA has all these, um, ha is always in, co in scandal and never gets out of it. Uh, and James Bennett said, that's what you should do. Yeah. Do a history of the NCAA, and it'll be a surprise to your readers and our readers, and see what you discover. And eventually, um, it, it turned me into an abolitionist. Because <laughs> <laughs> the Atlantic tradition, of course. That's how we were founded. Yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> that, I, I don't believe you can justify it. I believe it's going to, basically, I think that it's going to fall. I wish I, it was going to fall by a court or somebody confronting it on, on principles which it might, but I think more likely it's going to fall on the basis of competing greed because the NCAA gets $771 million just for running the March Madness basketball tournament. It has a monopoly on that. And the football schools, on the same rationale that Maryland was using, broke away, didn't want to give the NCAA a nickel of football contracts, and they're about to start a national football championship. And they're essentially rival cartels. And I think the football people are going to tell the NCAA that they can run March Madness themselves, thank you, and they don't need the NCAA. And that you're going to, these two, think, these two people are going to collide over greed, uh, not over principle, while the rest of us sleep through what really, to me, is, is a moral crisis. That the greatest tragedy to me is that it's not debated on any university because they're all complicit in it, even though universities are a place where you're supposed to have free and independent thought on fundamental matters of how the theoretical world meets the practical world. And there it is, right on your <laughs> campus, right in your stadium with your own students. And, and nobody has honest courses on that. Um, so if I were a university president, I'd have courses on that and on violence. <laughs> <laughs> so now, uh, please, uh, uh, yes, yes so, so wait for, uh, so, so I think a microphone will come to you. Please uh, identify yourself and then, yes, there's a microphone coming. Hi, wonderful to meet you at last. Uh, my name is Lucky Marmon. I'm just uh, in the middle of a book called The New Jim Crow. I don't know if you've Michelle heard of Alexander. it. But the author um, says that what has replaced our, our uh, segregationist policies and our Jim Crow laws is our justice system and the mandatory sentencing which has placed and disenfranchised an inordinate amount of uh, young black men. And I just wondered if that comes into your focus and your... Yeah, I have two favorite books on, on these subjects. Um, one is Michelle Alexander's. Uh, I, think, I think it's a very, very powerful argument on the legal side about... Um, 
how a lot of these things pile up unconsciously in you know arrest procedures, uh, prosecutorial decisions, uh, sentencing, uh, tr the the things that are plea bargained, the leverage over plea bargaining to get, to get a higher uh, so cumulatively they add up to these shocking disparities uh, when you can say that the 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 rate of drug consumption is relatively equal by race, uh, both as sellers and consumers, and, and, and yet the incarceration rates are so shockingly different. And it's, and it's kind of a, uh, a series of things that add up to that. It's a, it's a very, very serious indictment. I, 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 she, I'm waiting for her to take the next step to figure out exactly uh, what the best angle to get into this is. But like everything else, the larger thing we're talking about, if you don't believe that we can tackle difficult problems with any sort of sense of confidence, which I think is warranted from our history, then you approach the whole problem in a different spirit. So if we were approaching it in the right spirit, we'd be saying, well, maybe we can do something about this. She presents this indictment. What's the next step? The other book that I uh, really like and commend to you is uh, Isabel Wilkerson's book, The Warmth of Other Suns, uh, about unconscious uh, swaths of history. Uh, the great migrations uh, of World War I and World War II and how they affected the, the, the demographics of the United States. Um, she's a one I just saw her in Atlanta. I was at the Atlanta History Center on Tuesday and um, went out and had coffee with her because I've admired her work and we've met a few times. And um, she's out in the vineyard uh, uh, trying to promote this, also this awareness uh, of history in a broad cultural way. Yes, over here. And then first here and then here. Yes. Thanks very much. Um, I'm Garrett Mitchell, and I, um, I'd love to hear you uh, plumb a little bit more on the question that Jim talked about, which is about our political discourse c circa 2013 versus uh, earlier uh, times when things weren't great either. I've just finished uh, a remarkable book that um, uh, I had no intention of uh, reading and hadn't thought about before about James Garfield and uh, the, the assassination and, and the, the, the vitriol that was present in the political system then between the stalwarts and the half-breeds and the Roscoe Conklings and the et cetera. So in a sense that, that this, this coarseness has been with us from day one. My sense is that there is something different about the coarseness today and as someone who's been listening to political discourse more than most mortals and in, a, and, and in a way that most of us haven't, I'm curious to get as much sense from you as to whether you think um, the political discourse today is worse than at previous points in our history. Second, what if, if it is, what factors uh, political and cultural you think are contributing to that. And third, um, whether we are too concerned or not concerned enough about that change. Well, I think that's a really good question and a, and a difficult one. I would never say that our political rhetoric is coarser and worse today than it has been. Well, uh, uh, that's one of the great things about American history. You, yeah. It's you always can, bad. It's always, <laughs> it's always really, really bad. Uh, um, and uh, politicians have to have thick hides, and you have to figure out how to how to how to get through it. Uh, I would say two things um, are distinctive now. American race relations were much coarser in the civil rights era. Martin Luther King had to stand up in. Montgomery and talk in public about a black man who was executed for stealing two dollars and seventy-five cents. Um, uh, people didn't. It, there were still lynchings going on. It, it was a totally different world. But there was an underlying optimism about American politics for reasons that were only tangentially related to race because we had just gone through World War II and we felt we had licked Hitler and, and, and Japan and cured polio and there was, a, there was a kind of a, there was a general cultural optimism that lifted politics uh, in the general sense of can we tackle um, difficult problems. Now, even so, if confronting segregation and racial seg uh, separation required looking it in the eye, 
our best statesmen were looking at it maybe in, at, in the shin, you know. <laughs> so they were mumbling at best. That's the great thing about the movement is that it took even an optimistic culture and had to push it like crazy until, as I said, the, the tipping point at Birmingham to restore something else that contrasts with today, which was that in that era, and there's one chapter in here where you can hear President Johnson talking to King about it in one blessed moment about how it's essential that you have an aroused and active citizenry taking responsibility for the government, creating space and putting pressure on elected leaders to respond. That's when, that's when uh, reality takes place and when uh, reality improves. We're, we have a lot of little small citizens movements going on here. I think we're unconscious of how many NGOs, how many public interest people are scattered in fields that didn't exist 50 years ago, but they don't have a united sense of optimism that they're all attending the same store. And President Obama's mm -hmm. uh, language in the inaugural address perhaps can help draw that together in a, in a generalized optimism. And, and that's, that's hard to achieve. I don't think that the general level of nastiness is, is any worse, but I think we've had, an, we've had a paralysis for a long time, and we've got an awful lot of people who have inherited not a citizen's sense of movement, but a consumer's sense of complaint, that we sit back and complain and say Washington is, you know, uh, Washington is terrible, and uh, somebody ought to fix it for me. And uh, that's, that's unpromising. We've got to get past that. And the lesson of history is that it's going to be these leaders, like the new movement, somebody has to change people's sense of what is possible um, uh, by example, by rhetoric, and uh, to bring things to a new turn. So go here and then over on this side. Yeah. Hi. First, thank you for your meticulous and comprehensive history of the civil rights movement. Um, in this current environment where you have... And could you introduce yourself, yeah. please? Hi, my name is Andre Kearns. Thanks. Yeah. In this current environment where you have examples such as this very, that you mentioned, this very curated uh, 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 history um, put forth of King and the civil rights movement, and you have, as uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates mentioned, um, the first African-American president, with, in one hand, is the most powerful mm -hmm. Uh, man in the world, on another hand, is powerless in talking about things related to race. And you have the Texas School Board, as an example, really asserting politics into what goes into to textbooks. What, what's it going to take to ensure that we maintain some integrity and fidelity in how we tell the story of the struggle for social justice in this country for our kids and our grandkids? Well, yeah. first of all, um, I think the turning point, um, in the sense that the opposition may be running out of room, uh, might create a space, but it's not going to do the job. Uh, uh, we have to, next thing, we have to recognize that the younger generation does not get even uh, an, an inaccurate history through their umbilical cord, uh, let alone uh, an accurate one. We have to make a greater effort uh, to teach them. And we have to make a greater effort to mine the realistic hope from the history and, and share it. Because we're really about trying to change the culture. The, the, culture is what, the, the culture underlying shapes the boundaries of what politicians uh, can do. And you know they're fighting back too. And in my experience, I think a lot of them are, are better motivated than most people think. Uh, but they're limited by the culture. And so what we have to do from the other side is to try to shift. Dr. King and Bob Moses and Diane Nash, they shifted the whole culture of, 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 the, of the country without access to any traditional tools of politics. They couldn't vote. They didn't have newspapers. They didn't have armies. So people figured out a way to do it. So we, we have to do the same thing. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a broad um, challenge. But I think... I'm just hoping we might be coming up to a turning point where there'll be the opportunities if we can seize them and try to knit things together. Somebody on this side. Yes. Hi, Elizabeth Becker. Yes. Um, uh, wait for the uh, microphone. Set. Thanks. Hi. Um, Taylor, how do you see the current gun control issue within this prism, the environment you just talked about, in terms of nonviolence, our history of racial relations, and this sudden drop of an issue in the middle of politics? 
Uh, good question. Uh, it, everybody understand how do I see the gun issue in the context of yeah. this larger um, misframing of history? Well, I, I think I think people who've seen the world, as Jim says, coming together globally and um, uh, inter-knitted communities here uh, in the United States and jobs changing and things happening, if they're feel fearful and they want to huddle among their own, um, two generations of anti-government politics makes a lot of them susceptible, not for evil, evil reasons necessarily, but for unconscious reasons to say, what's protecting my freedom is the gun in my closet. Now, you can't find that anywhere in history. You can't find examples of that where freedom was protected by people running home and getting their Bushmaster out and, and, and coming down. Uh, um, but nevertheless, the fear may be there. And what it does is it convinces, it's part of the cynicism, that my liberty, my future, my optimism in an interdependent world lies in, in my own independent um, homestead and not in the ties that we knit together across the bounds that divide us. And to me, that's not only not accurate, that's not even patriotic because all of American history is about trying to build together the, you know, from George Washington on. But it, that doesn't mean that it's not real. It, to me, it goes to show how deeply people are in the grips of anti-government paranoia, even when it is an anti-politics paranoia, even when it's inaccurate and you can't uh, show any empirical evidence for it, and even when it doesn't really connect to the issue that you're discussing about it. It's the, ant it's the fearful um, uh, me first um, uh, attitude that, that, that triumphs over everything else. But again, I think that issue is raised. It informs why so many people are endorsing it and saying, let's put guns in the schools. Let's arm the kids, maybe. Uh, um, the, you know, yeah. you know the, owner of the, the owner of the Washington, and I can't even, the football, the professional football team in Washington. Uh, <laughs> it's a profound embarrassment yeah. to me in the 21st century. He's an avid uh, NRA supporter. He holds NRA events. Oh, Lord. In the stadium. W one more of his aspects of greatness. Yes. <laughs> and yet, and yet, of course, the logical extension of his theory is that he should tell everybody to bring their gun to the games. Yeah. But, of course, they don't allow guns in, in the games because you, you can imagine uh, <laughs> 70,000 drunk football fans who are armed and, and upset. Um, so it just goes to show yeah. how deeply we, uh, illogical all, all this is. But it's, it may not be winning politics yeah. now for the same reason and the same maturity or the same moment in history as President Obama's yeah. inaugural address might be wise. It might be a turning point. And to me, the optimistic side of that is we haven't done very much in the culture to promote how good this could be if we had a turn. For later discussion, I'll assert there's actually been a tension through American history between the collective and the independent survivalist mm -hmm. themes. I grew up in a survivalist land in, in desert California. So anyhow, we'll discuss that later. Okay. Somebody more? Yes, here. Uh, actually, actually, there and there and then here. So one, two, three. Yes. My name is Trudy Hodges, and I want to know what you think of the move by Republicans to change the con congressional districts yeah. And the Electoral College. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't, I, I, frankly, I don't know the specifics of what they're proposing. I suspect that they're probably not good. However, <laughs> um, and I c openly confess that given uh, uh, recent history. Um, however, the notion of debating representation and voting and apportionment and redistricting and the, the electoral, electoral college, I am definitely not against that. In fact, um, John Lewis and I had, a, had an, a, an event, I think it was last year, at the, uh, the Liberal Lawyers Group, the counterweight to the Federalist Society, in which we talked about the Voting Rights Act. And we agreed in, in that, that eventually 
we're going to wake up, I hope not too late, to realize that defending the Voting Rights Act as the be-all and end-all of our commitment to Voting Rights Act uh, is short-sighted. Uh, because eventually it's going to become an anachronism. No matter how good a law it is and how worthy it is today, we ought to be looking ahead today about more affirmative, because after all, the, the Voting Rights Act is about banning discriminations in voting. And we haven't done much thinking about, uh, about how in this age we can make voting fairer, uh, the counting of voting, how we can do it, how we can do the districts um, and apportionment and the Electoral College. I mean, if you accept <laughs> President Obama's premise uh, that we're really testing about the, 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 the inner promise of democracy that's being refined since the, 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 the founders' age, we ought to reform a lot of things to make them more democratic. And trust me, you're not going to think these Republican proposals are in keeping <laughs> with what you're saying. It's okay. a, it's a different, different way of doing it. I'm going to propose something radical. We have only 10 minutes left here. I'm going to make everybody who has a question give a one or two sentence version of your question. I'll write them down. You can choose how to answer them all. So let's just get all the questions out. Yes, here. Oda oh, Aberdeen, uh, Taylor. Can you talk about the role of leadership in the evolution in America in the last 50 years? And also globally, we have three prominent leaders, King, Gandhi, and Mandela. Great. Role of leadership. John, did you have a question? Yes. We're going to get all these questions out, and then Taylor, you have this lightning yeah, round. At, at the risk of asking you to generalize, um, how would you take the role of the media in terms of the cable news and blogs and internet and how does that, what's the interface between what you've been saying and the megaphone being very much different in terms of the media? Role of leadership, role of media. Yes, over here. I'm Beverly Kirk. In a nutshell, do you think Bobby Jindal, who is neither black nor white technically, is he the person who can help lead the Republicans uh, out of the wilderness on the issue of race. I'm writing these down for you. Okay, who else wants to get in the, yes, here in the, yep. I'm Garth Ross. You had asked earlier, Jim, about the quantity and quality of civic dialogue these days as compared to in the 50s and 60s. My question and my concern is the contexts and conveyances and mechanisms of the dialogue because the church community is different. Without segregation, there's less cohesiveness. The quality and character of dialogue at universities is different. So it's the mechanisms and conveyances. Where's the dialogue going to happen? Great. Thank you. Yes, Finley, yes. Vietnam and the history of the, of the civil rights movement and its impact on uh, the Johnson legacy. Great. Thank you. Yes, and behind you, yes. <laughs> You've essentially posited two motivations for that underlie the culture that you've described, hope and fear. Is there a formula for hope, historic formula, for hope overcoming fear so that it becomes, the hopeful culture becomes dominant? This is going to be really interesting. So who else was, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Ethelbert Miller, uh, I wanted to ask you about the placement of Robert Williams in terms of guns in the civil rights movement. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, Rosemary Reed, I wanted to, they talked about the Electoral College. They want to do apportionment. My other thing in terms of the Republican Party, will they be working on more voter suppression? Uh, great. So anybody else? Okay. Taylor, here is the task laid out for you and now the 10 minutes. Talking about the role of leadership. Wait. wait let's do, I, I want to try to do... Uh, like 30 seconds on each one of them. Good. Yes. Can we do that? Yes. The, the, role, the role of leadership. I think the great thing about leadership, and uh, there are 18 sections in here. Bob Moses is, is featured in three of them, and he is not really widely known as, a, as, a, as even a figure. And I'm putting him up, uh, and Diane Nash is in about three other chapters. So of the 18 chapters, uh, it's not about King, it's, it's about them largely for reasons of leadership because they are alternative models of leadership. And that's one of the great things about so Bob Moses of grassroots, almost uh, Zen, follow the people leadership. Martin Luther King is the, is, is the more classical orator, follow me kind of leader. And Diane Nash is the leader when there's no microphone. Um, which is what women were basically in the movement. Uh, and, and she, she 
was a great pioneer in understanding what a movement was and how you expand both the identity and, and the scope of a movement in historic ways. So uh, a lot of the purpose here, one of the guiding principles in trying to decide what was most salient here was to pick stories that show different kinds of leadership and social change because I think, I, I hope that will inf uh, inform a world where there are a lot of people out there in various uh, scattered forms of, uh, and, and that, that they won't think they have to pick one form of leadership and that they'll understand also that these people understood that they couldn't affect social change by studying entirely by studying how it had been done before that they are out there it's up to them to improvise and in the world of media um, I have in here a, a moment when CBS with three years of pre trepidation and uh, and preparation uh, expanded the Walter Cronkite uh, from 15 minutes to 30 minutes a night and didn't think there would be enough news to fill 30 minutes and that 15 minutes was going to have to stay and that they would be doing too much soft news and they wouldn't be able to do it. So obviously it was a different media age. Uh, the news was digested and presented. It had tremendous power. It had tremendous power through, uh, through in race relations. It's not true that the media, television media, came of age in its political impact in Vietnam. It came of age before that in, 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 in race relations. Now, we have all kinds of media, as you quite rightly say, of greater power, but greater um, dispersal and, and non-concentrated. And all it does is that it puts more responsibility on the consumers and generators of the media. It matters more how you choose what you read, how you choose to communicate, but if you do, you have more. So it, to me, it increases the risk of